Good morning. Welcome to the Bethesda Church Sunday School Hour. This is a fruit bearers class lesson for the 18th of October 2020. We're starting a new series of lessons today. The uh, series is called It's All In A Life of Commitment. There are seven lessons in this session, and we begin today with lesson number one, which is entitled, Christ's Commitment to Us. It is taken from Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 through 12, and also 18 through 21. The point of our lesson, even at our worst, Christ was fully committed to love us and bring us to God. Let us open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word and to learn more about you, Lord, and more about how we should live and more about our commitments. We are thankful for your commitment to us that you were committed to us and loved us even before we were born, that you have loved us enough to provide us a way to be forgiven of our sins, and that we have a path to everlasting life. Help us to be cognizant of our commitment and help us to be fully committed to both you and to our faith and in our obedience to you. We ask now that you be with those on our prayer list, Lord, those that are sick, those that uh, need your help desperately in order to uh, return to health. We ask that you be with the health providers, the doctors, the nurses, and the caregivers that are looking after these that are sick, Lord. Uh, we specifically pray for our brother, Ernie, and for Jim Pritchard, and for others that we know that are suffering right now and need your help, Lord. Uh, all these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The, uh, if you look on page 84 of your personal study guide, you'll see question number one in a photograph there. It says, what lessons about commitment were you taught growing up? Did you have someone, parent, grandparent, someone who talked to you about commitment? Taught you that your word was your bond? That when you told somebody you would do something, you were committed to do it? And you did it at all cost? If not, I hope that you've learned how to deal with commitment since then. I know as a child it was instilled in me that that when you told somebody you would do something, you would do it. And uh, I've always tried to live up to that. Uh, if I promise you I'll do something for you, I'll do it. And, uh, or die trying. And that's kind of the motto that, that, that we should live by. And that is what today's lesson is about. Christ was committed to us. Even before we were born, he loved us. Even when we were sinners, and his enemy, and did not trust him at all, he was still our friend and committed to us. Can you imagine that kind of commitment? Are you committed to your enemies? Do you have enemies? We should not have enemies. We should be forgiving those who trespass against us as the Lord forgives us in our trespasses. The point is, Commitment is something that has to be worked at and uh, thought about at least. A wedding doesn't take place if only one person is committed. Uh, who would want to marry someone who doesn't uh, love them or, or, or love you in return? Uh, that's not the case when we consider a commitment to Christ. History requires no greater act of commitment than when Jesus Christ loved us and willingly took our punishment and death as his own. Because of his great love for us, 
we're drawn to love and commitment and commit ourselves to him because of his love and commitment we are naturally drawn towards Christ because of his commitment on page 85 of your personal study guide it talks about commitment since people are kind of nervous or afraid of commitment today the bottom line is that we don't like commitment to illustrate, we're ready to jump at the special pricing promoted by the phone company or cable provider, but we cringe when we discover that the rate comes with a one-year commitment. More seriously, traditional marriage has been on a steady downward track for decades, but it's almost in free fall now. Among, among young adults, it's estimated that 25% will never marry one reason is commitment. People would rather not make a lifelong commitment than deep down they're not sure they can actually fulfill. Commitment is more palatable when you know the other person is absolutely committed to us and has our best interest in mind. That's what makes our relationship with God so special. He was committed to us before we even were committed to him. And on top of that, even when our commitment to him wavers, he never stops being committed to us. The greatest display of this is in our salvation. The setting for this lesson today is in Romans. In verses one through four, Paul wrote that people everywhere need to be saved because everyone has sinned against God. With Romans 5, he affirmed that people who give themselves to Christ can be confident that he has made them right with God through his crucifixion and resurrection. Now they can enjoy the blessing of righteousness and reconciliation. In Romans 6, Paul described how believers can grow spiritually in their walk with Christ. Let's go to our scriptures. Our first scripture is, of course, Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will die, yet preadventure for a good man would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine such a great love and commitment to humanity? Righteous, a righteous person is upright in his or her relationship with God and with others, while a good person is noble, generous, and honorable. In verse 6, Christ proved he was fully committed to us by dying for us. Well, how more committed could you be than that? We had no way of escape from our desperate situation because each of us have sinned. The judgment of our sin awaited and we had no way of avoiding it. Absolutely without strength. We couldn't do anything to make ourselves right with God. Nothing we could do would be enough for God to look with favor on us and declare that our sin debt had been paid. God could have left us that way, powerless to do anything about our sin. But he didn't. He took ultimate and he took the initiative to address our sin problem while we were yet sinning against him. Even while we continued to reject him and grow more hostile against him, he stepped in with the answer to our sin problem that would save us from the judgment to come. Paul wrote that Jesus came in due time. The perfect timing of God's response to our sin made such a difference to Paul that he also brought it up again in Galatians 4, chapter 4. God's timing couldn't have been more perfect from the perspective of history. 
<clears throat> also, God's timing couldn't have been better from a spiritual perspective. Every effort to save ourselves from the penalty of our sin had failed miserably. We had to hope, or we had no hope, of delivering ourselves from judgment. Our hopelessness placed us in a desperate situation. We needed someone to save us. Our only hope rested in God's taking the initiative to deliver us from our sin. God responded to our helplessness by sending Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. He came to die for us even though we're ungodly individuals. In verse 7, Paul's elaboration on the way Christ died for us looks so irrational on the surface. His death on the cross doesn't make sense to our reasoning. Someone who looks at Christ's death using human logic would agree with Paul's assessment about an individual volunteering to die for another person. We crave life too much, so we want to hold on to it with everything in us. That's why we fight through medical dilemmas, try to take care of ourselves and stay away from life-threatening situations. During a, uh, dying for another person simply doesn't seem too realistic. Granted, here and there, we observe a person dying for someone else, but such, a scarce, but such a sacrifice scarcely comes into view. The individual for whom someone would lay down his or her life would need to be a righteous man. Or such a person would have to be particularly good and inspire another to die for him or her. One might die for a fellow soldier whose life becomes threatened at the heat of, in the heat of battle. Instinctively, the camaraderie within a military unit may prompt a soldier to take a bullet for another person. Also, a mom's affection for her children might compel her to put her life on the line to protect them, even when there are adults. In verse 8, But who in the world would die for someone who hated him? The answer to that question comes in the shape of God's love towards us. Our sinful ways separate us from God. We rebelled against him and became hostile toward him, instead of showing that he had no interest in saving us from our helplessness and rebellion because of our sin. <coughs> God showed us something entirely different. He commendeth just how much he loves us. His love for us overflows from his heart. His love has not been generated by love for him. He doesn't love because we loved him first. Quite the opposite. He loved us first. In 1 John chapter 4, 19, reflecting on the depth of his love for us should fill us with humility and gratitude. Think about it. Knowing what God did for us even before we were saved should make us everlastingly grateful and want to be committed and obedient. As we think about the demonstration of God's love, we do well to take a long look at the cross. Something we want to, sometimes we want God to show us his love in our terms. For instance, we find ourselves asking him to prove his love by restoring our health, or we may ask him to give us resources to show he loves us. Perhaps we may expect him to validate his love for us by restoring our broken relationships with others. While such demonstrations might help us in the moment of our struggle, they don't come, they don't come close to tending to our greatest need. We need to be saved from our sin. For that reason, even when we were yet sinners who kept on ignoring, rejecting, and rebellion, rebelling against him, he provided the only way for us to be saved. 
of course, providing our salvation required Christ to die for us. Our next scripture comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. Key words in these is justified. When we're justified by God, we're officially considered to be individuals who have been made right with him. And atonement, atonement takes place when enemies stop fighting each other and become friends and go in the same direction together. To recap a little bit, the good news is what separates Christianity from every other belief system that has ever existed. If you're good, God will love you, other beliefs. Other beliefs say that if you're good, God will love you. If you get your act together, God will accept you. Christianity says you weren't good, yet God loves you anyway, even to the point of dying for you. You were helpless in your sin, but God needed you and accepts you anyway. In verse 9, Christ's commitment to us extended to reconciling us to God. That's why he took the initiative to come to us and die on the cross for us. His death made a new life in him possible because we paid the penalty for our sin so we could be justified. He paid the penalty for our sin so we could be justified. In other words, we have been given the honor of being with God when we think about the reality of being declared right with God, the picture of being pardoned comes to mind. Even though we're pronounced guilty because of our sin, we've been set free because of our sin debt has been forgiven. We're forgiven because the debt has been paid. Even though we could never pay our sin debt, our forgiveness comes at no cost to us. When Christ gave his life for us on the cross, his blood paid the penalty that our sin had imposed on us. While the blessing of having been declared righteous is enough to take our breath away, Paul shared that the Lord has done much more. Because he loves us, he saved us from the eternal punishment that awaits everyone whose sin has not been forgiven. A day will come when people who have rejected God's gift of salvation, will regret their foolish choice. That's when his, his eternal wrath will be poured out on them. God's wrath doesn't look like human anger that can be stirred up and poured out in a tantrum. Quite, quite the opposite. It's God's reasonable response to our sin. We deserve God's wrath because we're sinners but we can be saved from it because Christ pardoned us from the penalty of our sin by making us right with God with his death on the cross. In verse 10, Paul brought up another joyful reality that bears a striking similarity to the blessing of being made righteous. He referred to it as reconciliation. As we set out to describe it, he pointed out that one time we stood against God as his enemies. As enemies, we treated him as an adversary and we went to war against him. Our true nature as rebellious sinners who deserve God's wrath became evident. Colossians 1, 21-22 provides us with additional clarity about our hostility toward God and the rebellious path we chose for ourselves. Even though we lived as enemies to God, his love for us moved him to do so 
His love for us moved him to do something that would bring to us an end to the people's war with him. He took the initiative to do what was necessary for us to be reconciled to him. To reconcile means to bring the conflict between two peoples or groups to an end and to transform enemies into friends. When reconciliation occurs, enemy becomes friends and having by having hostility removed and replacing it with love. They stop fighting against each other and they begin to walk the same path together. God initiated our reconciliation with him by sending his son to die on the cross for us. Jesus' death ended the war of those who will follow him. When we give our lives to Christ, hostility against him gives way to peace with him. In other words, we've been reconciled to him. <clears throat> Ending the war and initiating a relationship with him that's marked by peace underscores only part of the blessed reality of reconciliation. While being reconciled with him through the death makes us want to shout with joy, we have much more to celebrate. The Savior died on the cross to pay for the debt of our sin, and he lives today to liberate us from its grip. In other letters, Paul affirmed the reality that Christ lives in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18, 20, and Galatians 2, verse 20. So did the writer of Hebrews, who referred to Christ as our high priest who lives and intercedes for us, John also made note of his living presence with us as our advocate. In verse 11, Paul's commitment about Christ in this verse encourages us to joy. Indeed, joy flows from our hearts and mouths when we ponder the way God took the initiative to reconcile us to himself. His love for us shines through his deliberate determination to end the war that raged between us and him. Even though we continued to allow sin to have control over us and turn us into his enemies, he provided the way of salvation for us by way of his forgiveness. Even though we continued to allow sin to have control over us and turn, it in, turn us into his enemies. He still provided the way of salvation for us by way of his forgiveness. Can you imagine? Our joy overflows when we consider how God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, made our salvation possible. He didn't set down rigid standards of reconciliation we had to accomplish for us to be saved. He knew we wouldn't be able to keep them. Neither did he set limits on our reconciliation with him. He mandated no probationary period that would allow him to continue the war if he found we had not lived up to his standards. Instead, he did something that makes us that makes sense only. Instead, he did something that makes sense only when we see it as an act of his love for us. He sent his son to die on the cross to end the war that had raged between us and our sin because of our sin. Raised in us because of our sin. Our Lord Jesus Christ alone made our intimate relationship with God possible. We received from his sacrifice for us what we could have never gained ourselves. He stands at the center of the privileges we enjoy because of the atonement his death provided. We're wise to stay focused on everything he did to make us right with God. Also, we do well to keep in view what he's doing now so we can grow as believers who have been set free from the penalty as well as the power of sin. And recapping, the good news of the gospel is that 
while we were still helpless in our sins, Christ came to this planet and died for us. Paul highlighted three things that happens to us because of the death of Christ on our behalf. <coughs> justified by Jesus' blood. The word justified means having right standing or right conduct. When death comes and we stand in the presence of God, the only hope we have of entering into his presence as as if we were or as if we have been made completely righteous in Christ. The only hope we have of entering into his presence is if we have been made completely righteous in Christ. Because of the blood of Christ, we never have to experience God's wrath, but only his love and acceptance. Reconciled to God through Jesus' death, at the heart of the gospel, we see God reaching out to us to reconcile us to himself. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and then 18 through 21, we read, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteous of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteousness. Of course, we're talking about Adam and Jesus. Because of Adam, all were condemned to sin. Because of Jesus, we have been made righteous. Moreover, the law entered. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but when sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, and even so might grace re reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Where sin has abounded, righteousness has abounded more. In verse 12, Christ devoted himself completely to giving us eternal life by dying for us. He turned enemies of God into friends who are loyal followers. By living in us, Christ works within us to give us freedom from sin's control as we serve him. Paul brought up one remarkable aspect of the presence of Christ in us because of Christ we have eternal life. He lives in us and he will live forever. He lives in us and we will live forever. Paul provides us with the account of how we came to receive Christ's gift of eternal life. The account involves two men. Paul's account takes us first to one man who brought sin into the world. Later in the account, he identified this man as Adam. The account of Adam's sin takes us back to Genesis 3. There we encounter the serpent <coughs> tempting pitch to Adam and Eve. He assured them eating the fruit from the middle of the Garden of Eden wouldn't have any ill effects on them. God had, God had warned them they would die, but the serpent assured them they would continue to live. They ate the fruit and immediately they began to experience the consequences of their sinful action. In Paul's account, he focused our attention on Adam. His sin plagued the entire human population. Because of Adam's act of disobedience, sin became a reality in our lives. From Adam's day to the present day, the tendency to sin continues to poison us and the effects of sin continue to contaminate us. And like any deadly plague, it always brings death to everyone who's been affected by it. 
Nobody can claim to be immune from death because it greets all men. And the reason is plain and simple. All of us are guilty of sin. By starting with Adam, Paul showed us that the consequences of death has been tasked, passed down from one sinner to the next. Nobody will escape it. In verses 21 to 19, in Paul's account, we went on to introduce the law of God to us as his way of showing us how we sinned. Of course, the law didn't come along until generations later during the time of Moses, Exodus 20. However, before the law existed, people still died. But dying, they validated that they had sinned against God. Paul continued to give the account of God's plan to save us from our sin by introducing us to another man, Jesus Christ. <coughs> he finished the drama of sin that Adam began. Paul drew attention to Christ. He underscored two specific actions. Of course, each man in Paul's retelling had responsibility for one of two actions. He, he identified first, Paul pointed to the offense Adam committed that opened the door for all people everywhere to, to sin as well. When we trespass, we cross a boundary line. Paul used the picture or word picture to imply that when we sin, we cross that line and puts us in violation of God's law. When we think about condemnation, our mind turns to a court setting in which the judge has pronounced us guilty and condemned us to suffer the consequences of our crime. In the same way, justification of Christ on the cross made our liberty possible. Instead of death, we have been given life through him, through Christ. Notice that Paul placed Adam's disobedience in stark contrast to Christ's obedience. Adam's action gave way to sin, but Christ's action allows us to be right with God. Christ's commitment to us did not end when he made us righteous in the sight of God. Christ's death also means we get to be with God when we die. Because of Jesus' commitment to us, when we breathe our last breath, our souls will be instantly transported into the presence of our Lord and Savior. We will live with him forever in a perfect peace and sinless bliss. In verses 20, 21, when Adam, what Adam did by sinning gave the way for everyone to be disobedient as well. We sin in the same way Adam sinned. When the law came along in the days of Moses, the act of disobedience people committed only abounded. The law multiplied our sin in that it allowed people to see themselves and their sin in exponentially greater detail. According to Paul, the law didn't save anyone. Rather, it showed them more completely how they had sinned against God. The law makes our sin more obvious. When we see ourselves through the eyes of the law, we get a realistic impression of how we stand before God. At the same time, we're given a clearer picture of how God deals with us and our sin. He doesn't want us to suffer from condemnation, quite the opposite. He intends for us to live as his children who have been set free from the consequences of sin. <clears throat> Such a blessing comes to us because of his grace. In his love, he gives us spiritual liberty and a new life in Christ, even though we do not deserve it. Our sin can never more abound than his grace can forgive us. When we received his gift of salvation through Christ, for ourselves we come to see his grace in greater, greater detail. That's when we observe that the mountain of his grace looms larger than the mound of our sin. One of the greatest blessings of God's grace comes into view in the gift of eternal life. Before we gave our lives to Christ, 
We lived under the oppressive dictatorship of sin. Living under sin's tyranny, we suffered as condemned sinners who had no hope. Our separation from God fostered our spiritual death and the certainty of our physical death awaited us someday in the future. However, God set us free from control of sin over, over us and placed us under the reign of his grace. As a result, we enjoy a personal relationship with God and the blessing of eternal life through Christ alone when we give our lives to him. To recap a little bit, one question still remains. Have you received the righteousness, inputting, wrath-saving, reconciling, eternal life-giving love of God? Your action step in receiving this gift of amazing grace is simply to believe God. It's called faith. Pray right now to God and confess that you are a sinner who needs his forgiveness and you want to receive that forgiveness through the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross. Through the shedding of his blood, God loves, God loves you more than your wildest imagination and he was fully committed to bring that love to you. You know, if you look on page 97, uh, 90, excuse me, 92 of your personal study guide, you see our little exercise we have each week called Engage. It says, take a time in, or think of a time in your life when you felt helpless and had to depend on someone else to get you through, whether it was, whether it was through sickness or injury or whatever. There might, it might have been a time when you depended pretty much totally on someone else for your care. Maybe they had to feed you, uh, address you, whatever, and, and ask you to think about how it felt to allow on someone else to accomplish what you typically would do for your own self. Then ask you to think about how this scenario compare or differ from our being helpless in sin and having to depend on Christ to save us. You know, people without Christ are living hopelessly in tyranny, hopelessly in control of sin with no hope and no future. And the only hope they have and we have is to depend upon Christ, be committed to him as he is committed to us. Be totally dependent upon him and what he can do for you. Have faith, have belief, and you can break the chains of sin and receive a righteous and forgiveness and everlasting life. On the next page, you look at the little exercise called Live It Out, and it asks a question. How will you respond to Christ's commitment? It suggests that you pray. If you never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, do so now. Find someone you know who is a committed Christian and ask him or her to help you through the steps of trusting in Christ. You can also look at the page first back of the cover in your personal study guide, and it will explain to you the path and how simple it is to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. It also suggests that you list, that you pray and reflect on Christ's commitment to you. Ask yourself, how am I living in light of Jesus' great commitment to me? Are you committed to Christ? Are you committed to living a life of obedience? Write down some ways you can live differently because of the great gift that you have received. It also suggests that you share Share the love and commitment of Christ with someone this week who never heard of it. And even if they have heard of it, if they haven't accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, you can still share with them. Pray that God would bring to your mind a name of someone who needs to hear the good news of the gospel. Then make it a priority to share that news with them. Again, to wrap it up and in closing of our lesson, Pray right now to God and confess that you are a sinner 
who needs his forgiveness and you want to receive that forgiveness through the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross through the shedding of his blood. God loves you more than your wildest imagination. He is fully committed to bring that love to you. Can you return that love to him? Let us close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for reconciling us to you, Lord. Thank you for your commitment to us. Thank you for loving us, not giving up on us, and providing us a way out of our sinful life and our sinful dilemmas, Lord, that we may receive righteousness and eternal life, that we may remain committed and more obedient to you, Lord. We thank you for bringing this lesson. We ask that you help us to understand it, to digest it, and to live by it, Lord. We ask again for your blessing on the sick, those that have coronavirus, uh, protect those that are ill with it, protect those who have not received it, protect them from receiving it. We ask that you be with the sick on our prayer list at our church, and in particular those visions as I named earlier, we ask that you be with them, touch them, help them, and return them to health, Lord, and bring them back to meet with us as we miss them and uh, worry about them and, and pray for them, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.